we are going to start with our E. coli. So earlier we discussed the enterobacteriaceae family. So let's recall the common characteristic features of all the bacteria in the enterobacteriaceae family to which E. coli also belongs. So the common characteristic features were that they all are gram negative bacteria. They are non fastidious. They all ferment glucose, but all cannot ferment lactose. But E. coli can ferment lactose also. Then all of them were catalase positive except the Cigella dysentery serotype 1 and then all of them were oxidase negative. So all this characteristic feature fits in E. coli as well. So we are going to starting, uh, we are going to start the E. coli here. So first let's talk about the virulence factors of the E. coli. So that can be classified on in two parts that is the surface antigens and the toxins. Okay, the surface antigens and the toxins. So the surface antigens includes the O antigen first of all. So O antigen if you remember then E. coli is a gram negative bacilli. Okay, so gram negative bacilli have a lipopolysaccharide portion in their cell wall. So that lipopolysaccharide portion has a component O. That O polysaccharide component acts as the O antigen for the all the gram negative bacteria. So here also the O antigen is a component of the lipopolysaccharide okay, portion of the bacterial gram negative bacterial cell wall there there used to be a lipid a p and then o so o is that part of the lipopolysaccharide portion of the bacterial cell wall of the e coli okay so that's all about the o antigen then h antigen h antigen is nothing but the flagellar antigen h for flagella h for flagella okay so h antigen is the flagellar antigen and how does it helps in the virulence of that bacteria so it provides motility to the bacteria that's why it acts as the virulence factor because it helps in the motility of the bacteria so it's that's why it is a virulence factor then k antigen k antigen is nothing but the capsular antigen okay it is not always present in the bacterial cell wall of the e coli but whenever it is present whenever the k antigen is present it covers the o antigen from surrounding okay and protects from the o antecedent that means if you will be able uh, if uh, you isolate the E. coli and if you try to coagulate it with the, you know, uh, uh, I mean, clump it with the O antecedent, then you will not be able to uh, clump uh, this E. coli which had this K antigen because the O antigen of that E. coli will be covered by K, K antigen. Na? So that O antecedent will not be able to uh, agglutinate with this type of E. coli which has this K antigen. So that's the importance of the K antigen. Okay, it is it makes the E. coli uh, non agglutinable by O antecera. Then the fimbrial antigen. The fimbrial antigen. How does fimbria help in the uh, virulence? So we know from our basic knowledge from the general bacteriology that fimbria or the pili helps in the adhesion to the surfaces. So that means it helps in the colonization of the bacteria and colonization is very important in the pathogenesis of any bacteria. Na? So that's why this fimbrial antigen also acts as a virulence factor for the E. coli. Now comes to the toxins. So toxins are not produced by all of the E. coli. Rather there are two most important E. coli which produce the toxins. Those are the enterohemorrhagic E. coli that is EHEC and then in enterotoxigenic E. coli which is called as ETEC. So EHEC produces sega like toxin okay that produces sega like toxin or the verocytotoxin verocytotoxin this is otherwise uh, the uh, name of the same toxin so sega like toxin or verocytotoxin the meaning is the same okay or they are referring to the same toxin. So enterohemorrhagic E. coli uh, hemorrhagic E. coli produces the sega like toxin or the verocytotoxin and that uh, how does what is the mechanism of action of that toxin the mechanism of action is that they reduce the protein synthesis by inhibiting the 60s ribosome by inhibiting the 60s ribosome they decrease the protein synthesis so what happens so we will see what happens next whenever when we will be seeing the EHEC separately okay so there we will see how does this decrease in the protein synthesis help in the uh, virulence of that enterohemorrhagic E. coli. Now come to the enterotoxigenic E. coli. So enterotoxigenic E. coli produces two types of toxins. By T we, we see that it is ETEC. E so ETEC when write T for 
2 so it produces two toxins okay it produces two toxins those two toxins are the heat level toxin and the heat stable toxin so by t you remember that it produces two toxin one is heat is level and the other one is the heat stable okay now that heat level toxin what is the mechanism of action so heat level toxin acts by increasing CAMP cyclic AMP how does it increase the cyclic AMP because it this heat level toxin activates the adenylate cyclase enzyme so whenever the adenylate cyclase enzyme gets activated that converts the ATP to the cyclic AMP to the cyclic AMP so it acts by increasing the cyclic AMP while on the other hand the heat stable toxin heat stable toxin in uh, acts by increasing the cyclic GMP okay how does it increases the cyclic GMP so it increases cyclic GMP by activating the guanylate cyclase so whenever the guanylate cyclase is uh, activated there is increased production of the CGMP okay CGMP but at the exam time we will you will get confused and will not be able to remember the mechanism of action of these two toxins so how are we going to remember this uh, you know mechanism of action so whenever you are writing st okay whenever you are writing st then just uh, turn it slightly turn this as slightly and it becomes g like this okay so it is ulta s na it is ulta s it is looking like something like s so it is looking something like g also so it is it it is acting by increase increasing the uh, gmp okay cgmp so it acts by increasing cgmp so if we, if you know that uh, heat stable toxin acts by increasing cgmp then obviously the leftover that is the heat level toxin will be acting by increasing cmp it's so simple so heat level toxin is acting by increasing cmp while his uh, stable toxin is acting by increasing cgmp so what happens after this increase in the CMP or CGMP? So after their increase, there is increased outflow of the water and the electrolytes to the gut lumen. And whenever there is increased electrolyte and the fluid into the gut lumen, that is going to cause the diarrhea. So this is the pathogenesis of the heat stable and the heat level toxin of the intero, uh, enterotoxigenic E. coli. Enterotoxigenic e. coli. Okay, we will see the pathogenesis of this Sega like toxin when we will be dis discussing the enterohemorrhagic E. coli. Now, let's talk about the infections which are caused by E. coli. So, the infections which are caused by E. coli are the urinary tract infection, first of all, which is caused by the uropathogenic E. coli. The uropathogenic E. coli, UPEC, UPEC. This is uropathogenic E. coli which causes this urinary tract infection and max i mean almost uh, you know 70 to 80 percent cases of uti are caused by e coli only okay so that is a very big number so uh, about 70 to 80 percent caused by e coli those are called as the upec that is uropathogenic e coli now diarrhea so diarrhea is caused by many e coli and they are there are several pathotypes of the e coli which cause the diarrhea those pathotypes are the enteropathogenic E. coli which is called as EPEC then enterotoxigenic E. coli which is called as ETEC then enteroinvasive E. coli which is called as EIEC then enterohemorrhagic E. coli, e. coli which is called as EHEC and then enteroaggregative E. coli which is called as EAEC and then diffusely adherent E. coli which is called as DAEC so these are the six pathotypes of the diarrheogenic E. coli I mean those E. coli which produce diarrhea they are classified into several pathotypes and these are those six pathotypes okay out of them the important ones are the enterotoxigenic E. coli which causes the traveler's diarrhea okay so enterotoxigenic E. coli causes the traveler's diarrhea how are we going to remember T4 entero I mean see here it is ETEC so toxigenic ET enterotoxigenic t4 toxigenic t4 travelers so toxigenic e coli is causing travelers diarrhea is causing the travelers diarrhea then the second important is the eiec that is the entero invasive e coli the entero invasive e coli so whenever there is uh, this word comes that is invasive so invasive means it is going to cause some bleeding whenever there is invasion of something there occurs bleeding so 
that means if the if this e coli is going to invade the gut uh, wall then it will be causing some bleeding that means there will be there will not only be diarrhea rather there will be bloody diarrhea that will be called as the dysentery so this entero invasive e coli causes dysentery while the next important one is the entero hemorrhagic e coli that by the name is uh, by the name we can understand that hemorrhagic means it will cause some amount of bleeding that means it will cause bloody diarrhea and one more disease that it causes is the HUS with the uh, a particular type of a particular strain of the E. coli is involved in the hemolytic uremic syndrome that you will learn in your medicine uh, you know in your medicine uh, subject in the fourth year so uh, for the time being just remember that enterohemorrhagic E. coli causes dysentery and the hemolytic uremic syndrome the hemolytic uremic syndrome and the dysentery is caused by enterohemorrhagic E. coli and a particular strain of E. coli, e enterohemorrhagic E. coli causes HUS that is O157, O1, O157, H7, okay, O157, H7 strain of the E. coli is involved in causing the hemolytic uremic syndrome, okay. Then also this E. coli can cause peritonitis, can cause pneumonia, can cause meningitis, very important cause of meningitis is E. coli. Then it can cause wound infection, also it can cause osteomyelitis. So these are all the infections which are caused by the E. coli but here as we are discussing this topic in the gastro uh, intestinal uh, portion or the GI infection. So here we will be concentrating more on these, you know, this part of the E. coli that is the diariogenic E. coli and we will be discussing more about these more about these six types of e coli more about these six pathotypes of the e coli six diariogenic pathotypes of the e coli so that's all for the virulence factors and the infections caused by the e coli next we will see the lab diagnosis of the e coli infection